Here we have the fuel manifold and the fuel nozzles after being cleaned up. Uh, this is the original one removed from the engine in the videos. Uh, here are the nozzles. I've cleaned these and soaked them in uh, cleaned them in solvent and then I cleaned them in an ultrasonic cleaner um, with some Dawn in water, Dawn dishwashing detergent. That is not a plug, it's just a good product. It degreases. Uh, this is a nozzle. It's uh, basically a, about like a, an oil furnace or oil burner style nozzle. It threads in to these, everyone, there's 12, there are 12 bosses uh, on this manifold and these, the nozzle, the nozzles thread into right into this uh, boss and there's no gasket or anything it just threads in if I can get it like that it's that simple uh, we got them all cleaned up uh, I need to have this checked for leaks uh, I believe uh, one of the one of my viewers commented um, that could be a possibility of or it could be a cause of the damaged turbine nozzle if the nozzle itself is not bad then it could just be a, a, an actual leak springing, say, from this weld joint here. If you were to be spraying from there, that's uh, not good, obviously. From what I understand, uh, most nozzles wear out from actual the liquid that's sprayed through them or being forced through them, wearing them out. In this case, you have about 400 pounds per square inch with your kerosene or jet fuel spraying through these. If you'll notice, this has a nice little fine mesh uh, screen. It's like the final, final filter maybe before the nozzle. You can remove that screw, I'm assuming, and take that apart. There's a part number on it, as you can see there. And I believe these are rated at 160 gallons per hour. Um, that's just what I've, to read what the manual states. Uh, the fuel inlet is right here and there's a 90 degree fitting that threads into there with an o-ring on it and then that is to what we connect our flexible AM fitting line and then the fuel just basically distributes all the way around here and sprays back obviously this is this side faces toward the back of the engine and if you'll notice these bosses are on an angle so they're not spraying straight back you have actually that alignment so they're kind of direct in a conical, you know, they direct uh, in a cone fashion, you know, toward this, I, I don't know. It, it, you can see that the fuel though does spray, or the, they are aimed at an angle. They're not straight back. And here's all the rest of the nozzles here all cleaned up and shiny. We can see the back side of this fuel spray bar which actually I guess is the front side this would be the side towards the compressor this is how it would sit in the engine and the not the inlet is at the six o'clock position straight at the bottom so it would sit like this well that covers fuel nozzles and fuel manifold we'll go to the next component set alrighty now we're gonna take a look here at our very major component of this engine this is the, uh, well, it would be the impeller and compressor rotating assembly and the coupling shaft, which connects it to the turbine. Um, all right, I lifted it up here on this to set it. We get a little view of it. Here is the overall side view. Um, obviously, the turbine wheel is not connected. Okay, let's take a look closer look here. What you see into the at the inlet of the engine or the intake are these uh, blades. I'm assuming again we'll call these blades because, well, they move. They're on a rotating part. Uh, technically, you'll see this is a two-piece. This front part here, this is silver, more silver metal, and then we have the back part. I believe this is aluminum and this is magnesium. But these are two separate pieces. This is called the impeller, which I guess, or an inducer, which really I guess is its job is to bring air into or direct the air into the engine. 
and then this back part is called the actual compressor. This type of compressor is referred to as a centrifugal or radial compressor because the air enters here and it is flung outward as as it is as its roots started spinning by these these blades it its mass throws it outward where it's collected and then directed back through a diffuser and where its pressure is raised so at that point that's how this works unlike most of the engines especially nowadays are mostly axial flow engines uh, smaller turbine engines uh, work good with a centrifugal compressor it's more efficient in a smaller size when you get into the larger engines uh, the axial is better this is a stub shaft here obviously protruding from the front this race rides or this machine surface rides inside of the inner race of the front bearing here are the threads for the spanner nut and if you're noticing here we have internal splines internal splines are for this short coupling shaft which slides in there okay and then this couples into your accessory drive housing through the front of the engine all right here are here are the components that lock this is a left hand thread so it's backwards to me but left hand threads on and when it's tightened properly you insert this little locking ring or I guess you don't call it a rail maybe anyway it's 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 got teeth that also engage in slots on the shaft then we have this snap ring I guess you would call that maybe you would call this a lock ring anyway it's a snap ring and it snaps inside into a groove and retains everything engaged uh, all those teeth are engaged so this nut can't come loose and turn flange here is where we attach the turbine wheel uh, as you see there are numbers this is all factory there it goes one two three it goes one through nine and I don't know if this is in reference to balancing I would assume so as this is rotated and balanced um, there are, are several ways to balance it one of them is grinding material from the back side of the actual um, compressor and or the turbine wheel a finer balance adjustment for the rear end is is the thickness of the bolt heads that go here and they actually can be changed to get different bolt weights for your turbine wheel bolts to get a balance I don't know that's outside of my realm uh, this is gonna have to go to a professional to be balanced once I get ready to before we can use it obviously because as it sits it's uh, we're assembling it with a we'll be assembling this with a different turbine wheel than which was on this engine which will change the balance and it will have to be balanced at that point before uh, using it we'll go ahead and cover the uh, front bearing while we're at it uh, this is up this is the bearing that goes here and this is the same style bearing as the as the turbine it's a ball bearing so it can be used and actually in this engine this bearing is the thrust bearing this engine uh, in the on the rear and the rear bearing the stub shaft will move through here as the engine heats and the shaft length grows and as it cools and contracts uh, most engines have uh, a roller bearing for that application a roller bearing allowing uh, the actual inner race to move within the bearing in this case the inner race is fixed because it is a ball bearing inherently ball bearings are thrust bearings because they will not allow this race to move forward or backward but in this engine the rear stub shaft is machined so that it will it will move within this race on the turbine bearing the rear bearing on the front bearing or where it goes here this is locked in place on the face of this and here we have a couple of shims and these shims go right up here onto this to this face that is what adjusts the position of the shaft in the engine as we bring the we reduce the shim thickness as you reduce the shim thickness 
the shaft will be moved forward in the housing. And if you increase these shims, it moves the shaft rearward. What that changes is the clearance between these, it changes the clearance between the edges of these blades and the intake housing, compressor housing. It also changes the clearance and distance between the turbine rotor blades and the turbine nozzle. As we move the shaft forward, these get closer and closer to the inside of the compressor housing and at the same time the turbine blades get closer to the turbine nozzle and so on. So this is critical. Again there's obviously numbers here that we have to check. So this basically has to be assembled into the housing and the, the cowling and the rear bearing installed, housing installed, tightened together and then we check the clearances. This bearing also has a swivel style as you can see it's a nice piece. This is made by Fafner. Um, good old made in USA stuff here. This is back in the day. I'm assuming this bearing was made you know, in the 50s. This is an original, as far as I know, this is a bearing, original bearing. It's the one I took from this engine. This is the front piece housing cover of that bearing. Uh, the bearing does not actually fit in this piece. This is only a cover. The tiny hole you see there, that passage, is the orifice that sprays the oil air mist onto the bearing and then there is the uh, orifice inlet or the passageway through which the oil and air travel that mates up with a passage in the front housing so okay we've covered now the main components of the engine internally okay all right we'll take one more quick look here we're just about out of battery we'll try to get you uh, a little bit more then we're gonna have to stop Well, we're going to do a quick uh, little blast here of the back side of the compressor assembly and then we got to stop. Battery's about out. So uh, quickly we can see here that some of the balancing occurred by just them grinding away at the metal here. You just see two divots ground into this material. Uh, 